Hi, this is Jeff with the INTJ Equation. This is a channel from the lens of an unhealthy INTJ. And today I'm joined by Brett, who is an ESTJ. Uh, Brett, would you like to tell people about yourself? Well, my name is Brett. You can also call me Rex. Uh, from North Carolina, specifically the Charlotte area. Moved around a lot in my life. Um, I've gone to, I've lived in lots of different states, gone to schools in lots of different places. I currently study in North Carolina as well. I'm a business management major. I'm a psychology minor. I plan on having a master's in industrial and organizational psychology. And uh, I have many odd hobbies like researching philosophy, uh, theology, and martial arts. Oh, really? You, do you do martial arts? Yeah, I do jujitsu and Krav Maga. I've done some other things over the years. Okay, nice. I do judo. Yeah, hey. <laughs> Very close to jujitsu in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Some other jujitsu. Yeah. All right. So, what's it like being an ESTJ in your perspective? I know you're a bit skeptical of typology and MBTI and. That's an important, that's an important note. I, I am very much uh, more of an advocate of big five, hexaco and, and those kinds of uh, factor analysis approaches. Um, from what I understand, I'm a neat uh, about organization, about step-by-step -step process, uh, bottom up thinking. Um, I would say that every day is marked by thinking, how am I going to approach step-by-step -step this problem? Um, how am I going to organize my time? How am I, when am I going to do this assignment? Who am I going to do it with? What is appropriate here? What's effective? What's efficient? And I feel like way too many ESTJs, that sounds like, oh, he's super conscientious, right? You know, he's a super good worker and he's a good at all. No, 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 no. Just because you have that thought process of how to organize your time doesn't mean you're going to do it well. Um, and I feel like, from what I hear and from what I understand, too many ESTJs and TE users in general get way too caught up in efficiency to the point where they tend to have a very low morality, much more than they think, um, mm -hmm. in order to ends justify the means, right? Um, and so I think a lot of ESTJs struggle with anxiety, and that's not something they want to talk about because FI inferior, right, if you're an ESTJ. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, people are just apprehensive about talking about trauma and anxiety in general and depression, um, especially if they're the more conservative, right leaning types, as I notice ESTJs, ENTJs and those types tend to be. Maybe that's true. Um, and I, I think that especially as a psych student, I would like people to open up about their internal feelings more and to be to to say, yeah, this is where I fail and my organizational like uh, preferences, this is where I fail. Uh, here's some of the faults of being overly cautious, right? But uh, I don't see that a lot. Yeah, yeah, I think that TE is a very, uh, the efficiency driven function and INTJs do it kind of differently, but it's a pessimistic function for INTJs. So they don't really like using the TE as much as like a ESTJ or ENTJ would. Mm. Kind of like your bread and butter, because like what you do the best, you know? Right. And, and it's interesting because a lot of the time I hang out in philosophy servers on Discord and in real life, and supposedly you find a lot of INTJs, INTPs, mm -hmm. and uh, they are not always the best people at debate because they don't like to use that extroverted thinking. They don't like to bounce off of people and to actually approach these things in a cohesive way. It becomes very defensive very quickly. I'm right, you're wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Or they just don't approach the subject at all. They're avoidant, right, of conflict. Yeah, INTP is definitely more so than INTJ as well. Once INTPs have their mindset that they're right, they think that they're right and they'll kind of go to the death with it. Yes, yes, they will. <laughs> I do not do well with them. <laughs> so what um, kind of philosophy are you into? Um, mainly where I specialize is stoicism. And there are some people listening in who will be like, oh, that guy, right? No, 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 no. So basic rundown. Lots of people think stoicism is you can't be emotional, uh, discredit women, and, uh, you know, workout gains, right? Ultra masculinity. It's not. No. It is very much not. Uh, Marsonius Rufus, who's the teacher of Epictetus in around 30 AD, so this was 2,000 years ago, says 
women should be educated like men because they have they are just as capable of not fearing pain or death and they are just as capable mm. of reason it's a pretty radical thing to say 2000 years ago in roman society right yeah for sure so stoicism is going to be about cosmopolitanism and virtue ethics it's going to be about this internal enrichment of your character and the self-sufficiency that happiness comes from the self and that you shouldn't put your happiness in external things uh, because you're bound to be disappointed. Seneca says we suffer more in imagination than we do in reality. It's about, it's about coming to terms and accepting the, other, the external things. That doesn't mean that they're okay. It just means that we're aware of the devils we're dealing with, right? And we accept them for what they are and then we can <clears throat> fix the problem from there. Um, Philosophy of science is interesting to me. Philosophy of mind. So that's going to be like dualism versus uh, physicalism, uh, stuff like that. Uh, you know, philosophy of language. So Wittgenstein, right? Uh, and other people along those lines, pragmatism. So Dewey, Pierce, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then philosophy of religion is going to be interesting. Um, there's lots to say about that. So all sorts of areas. It really just depends. But I like uh, analytic philosophy more so than I like continental philosophy. Continental is focusing more on the meaning of life, purpose, all this like vague stuff. Whereas analytic philosophy is trying to focus more on like logical stuff we can maybe prove or like come to reason to, right? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I definitely probably not as well researched in as you, but it, stoic philosophy has definitely been a big help. I think uh, a lot of it came from a uh, like CBT, a lot of ideas mm. from CBT came from Stoicism. Mm -hmm. And RABT, <clears throat> Albert Ellis, I believe. Uh, uh, it became the foundation for logotherapy, which then influenced RABT and CBT. And of course, those are some of the most effective uh, therapeutic methods we have. Yeah, Albert Ellis, I just stumbled upon him recently. He's the rational analytic therapy or something like that, isn't it? Yes, uh, rational emotive behavioral therapy. Okay. Yeah, I just kind of crossed because I was looking up rational psychology, which is kind of like an old dead system. Uh, mm, yes, yes. Um, and, you know, and, and humanistic uh, psychology still has its place with Carl Rogers. Uh, you yeah. know, I am not like I support it, but I personally wouldn't do it kind of thing. Right. <laughs> it's not for me. Yeah. But that's the thing with therapy is that one therapeutic <clears throat> method is not the same for everyone. Right. So. Yeah, I definitely read some Maslow. I haven't read much in Rogers. Um, it doesn't even do you any service to, I mean, no one uses Maslow, right? I mean, the hierarchy isn't even like comparable. It's like, because you can have self-actualization without having the physiological needs, right? And that's stoicism. That's stoicism's entire thesis, right? Is that you can do that. Aristotle will disagree, but who cares for what Aristotle has to say on virtue ethics? Yeah, Dostoevsky grew up in poverty in Russia and he became like, very prominent figure and didn't have a lot of he was alone and mm -hmm. but his family kind of abandoned him he was still supporting him and he kind of just self-actualized on his own exactly right <laughs> you know uh human development is a lot more complicated than a pyramid right um and that's something to work our way into typology and some of my critiques in it if i may um my professor who uh graduated from university of alabama and um, his professor claimed to be the uh, little Albert child uh, from B.F. Skinner's experiment, where uh, he, oh, really? you know, makes a very loud noise behind a baby. His professor claimed to be that baby. It's probably not true. But anyways, yeah. he's super dope. And he's like, listen, so there, there's an issue in saying that there's 16 personalities. You can say, and not, not everyone in the typology community says this because it's so broad. But you can say that there's a spectrum of ESTJ. So if you put me and my evil twin right here, we're not going to be the same exact ESTJ, but we're going to still be using the same functions, but maybe not to the same conclusions or something, right? Fine. You're still saying there's 16 personalities from which there is then spectrums upon. Mm -hmm. What five-factor analysis is saying is that you're a fifth dimensional object, which is really hard to imagine because humans don't deal with that. You're a 50, you're a 40, you're a 30, you're a 20, and you're a 10, and it creates this fifth dimensional plane, right? Uh, it's, like, it's like the political compass if it was five dimensional, right? And we're only accounting for part of your personality traits. 
and we're just saying this is like this is what you're like right here right now we have no mm -hmm. idea what you were born with we have some genetic idea right because for example extroversion is one of the more genetic factors uh with your parents specifically and we can even track childhood scores uh using different tests and different measures we can even track childhood scores into adulthood and then adulthood into later adulthood and it's going to be a lot more consistent than a lot of the typology that you will have because i agree with typo most typologists will say you can't do online tests to be typed okay. and i think that's pretty fair right because like for example if you score 51 percent on your e score and you're an ESTJ instead of an ISTJ, that's ridiculous, right? That, that's because they're completely different, right? Mm -hmm. Even though the most people that that wouldn't seem like much of a difference, but it is, right? Even I know that. So now you have to be typed by somebody. Well, where does this tradition come from? This tradition comes from the psychoanalytics. This comes from Freud and Eric Erickson and uh, Korn, uh, yeah, Karen Horney and uh, Jung and, uh, and Lacan and other in and, and, uh, Freud's daughter and all, all, all these people, right? Mm -hmm. Where you take a trained psychoanalytic and we sit down and I analyze things about your dreams and free association and talk therapy and all these things. And I start to discern, you know, things about your unconscious mind through your conscious mind. That's dubious at best, right? First off. Second off, it's not a diagnosis, right? Like we're not looking at physiological things and going, oh, you were touched as a child, right? That's not what the psychoanalytics are doing. They're going, oh, you like smoking because you were weaned too early or too late in the oral stage of development. Oh, for, uh, yeah, Freud's That's sex, Freud. sexual theories, yeah. Yes, actually, the psychosexual theories, which there's no evidence for, by the way. There's literally no evidence for just about anything Freud said. And by the way, Jung, too. So Jung takes what Freud is saying, and he, he the only thing that changes is this idea that of general psychic energy instead of the libido. The libido mm -hmm. for Freud is that uh, sexual energy that flows through you as you develop. Um, to, for, Jung's going to call that a more general psychic energy right like life energy yeah and whatever the fuck that means right like you know that, <laughs> let me let me take an mri real quick and let me find your your psychic energy right like obviously not um and then freud's gonna talk or Jung's gonna talk about like the collective unconscious mm -hmm. and for those who don't know that is going to be this collection of memories and experiences that go all the way back to pre-human species that are in you somehow right according to what right there's no evidence for this that this is an extrapolation of like nothing it's intuition right and that's fine but we shouldn't treat it like it's fact and of course Jung goes on to do this for his personality types as well for his cognitive functions which by the way is not even how we define cognition in in modern cognitive psychology um Jung also, and these are my words, uh, Jung also believes that there will be a universality in these experiences, such as most humans had a parent, experienced mm. a bump in the night, or worshipping a divine figure, and that these experiences, quote, leave an impression, end quote, on us. More simply, we are predisposed to perceive certain things in certain ways. If a father behaves in a nurturing way, then the baby's response is to receive the nurturing positively. Thusly, this aligns with the baby's perceptions and reality. So he's saying that humans are born with these base perceptions, these base intuitions, and that if other humans align with those intuitions, then like it's, it's like a self-actualization. It's like a good thing. Where, where do we even begin to prove any of that, right? So that's, that's not what most people would now call psychology, right? That's like philosophy, right? Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about <clears throat> we're talking about these essential characteristics to humans in, in a, in a non-scientifically provable way that is philosophy in a nutshell that's religion and that's and that's fine let's just acknowledge it for what it is it's not modern psychology and so when we talk about 
big five to work into that. Um, we're not necessarily talking about essential human traits either. We're, we're more talking about like, there's something called the lexical hypothesis, which is going to say that uh, if there are important traits uh, within human society that will will make words for them and that we can and that these these words can become umbrella words. So bashful, right? Like I could describe you as a bashful person and that's a real trait. That's like a real phenomenon. As much as me saying you're tall is a real phenomenon, right? It's something in our language that describes a real thing. Um, so if we can do that, then we can do that for factor personalities. And so purists are going to say factor one, factor two, factor three. We would, of course, when we say big five, we would say extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness. It doesn't matter what we call them. The factors are real. They're, they're, uh, we could take 10,000 terms and factor them down into five, five factors about like with minimal statistical noise. And we have objectively five factors to prove about human personality that we can demonstrate, we can prove through um, genealogical studies, that we can prove through looking at these person's lives and, and measuring their conscientiousness, like in Mitchell's marshmallow test, right? As just to name an example, um, we can name all sorts of stuff. Uh, it's a lot harder to, to explain though than it sounds. Yeah, to go back to your first statement, I know you said there's 16 types and it's hard to prove it. And there's, you know, Enneagram and there's subtypes oh. and all that. Uh, but I think like typology and just like you're an ESTJ and I'm an INTJ, it's a very like the skeletal system of us. It's just like we use these functions, but we use them in a different way. We have different yeah. experiences, different trauma, different interests, different tastes. And I think the abstract theoretical thing is pretty important. I think that's something that humans are losing touch with. I think that's just where new ideas come from. Even like Albert Einstein said, is an imagination is more important than intelligence, really. Sure. I think, but when Albert Einstein said that, I think he said that meaning let's imagine things that we can then put into use, right? Um, so that kind of creativity, the creative problem solving right, is, is what I think he's really talking about. And Neil deGrasse Tyson is going to talk about, but which, by the way, bad example, but still. Um, I'm just saying that I don't see the use if we can't even establish correlational data with, like, you know, for example, for supposed ESTJs and, like, trying to prove functions, which we can't um, because there's no way to measure them. It's like, oh, this person leads with TI well, how do we prove that, right? Well, we really can't. Um, and from what I understand, one of the best studies that use socionics, I believe, uh, at best had some mild correlation. This, so this is where we are with typology, right? At mild correlation. Meanwhile, in trait personality and in factor mm -hmm. analysis, we're starting to establish cause. We're starting to eliminate the polygenetic or multiple genetic factors behind personality. We aren't at an explanatory level yet, but we're getting there. We're getting even better in our descriptions of personality and we're getting better at establishing exp explanation and it's cross-cultural, right? Mm -hmm. And so I see where these two things are going and I see how one of them is a lot more rigid and is like provable and we can use online tests for and is highly reliable versus the other one that I think is like has a long way to go before it's even reliable, let alone valid, right? Um, for example, the Rorschach test, the center for it um, is actually near Asheville, where I live, and, or Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, they finally, just now, after like 80 years, got to the point where they're reliable. So one Rorschach test giver gets the same result as another Rorschach test giver, right? It's just not reliable. It's still not valid, right? That's mm -hmm. the problem. It's still not valid. So why would mm -hmm. we ever use a Rorschach test, right? I agree we should be creative, but we should be creative with the tools that we have and we should know which tools are advancing and which tools aren't 
and probably what's more worth our time uh, to be creative with. Um, but it, it fundamentally depends if you care about proving typology. If you don't care and you're just all for it, then go ahead, man. But if you're trying to say that like, oh, it's better in the big, big five and it's, you know, and in uh, psychologists like use it and blah, blah, blah. Or if they don't, they're stupid. It's like, none of that is true, right? Just mm -hmm. none of it. Um, we have much different rules to abide by. And plus we answer to a council of other psychologists who have like very limited to no bias when we have, whenever we post a paper. What council holds typology together? There's no association that does that, right? Mm -hmm. There isn't even a single school of typology. There's at least like only two schools of trait personality, Hexaco and Big Five, and they're not even all that different. But there's no unification between Enneagram and Socionics and Big Five, uh, uh, sorry, and um, MBTI and or Eric Sorensen or whatever his name, like it, it's gotten so absurd specific YouTubers have their entire own systems and have like no qualifications, right? Mm -hmm. Except in bullshitology. That's all. So like uh, studies and empirical data, credentials and stuff is very important to TE users. Yes. So what about like TI users that just think like who are autodidacts and just educate themselves? Why do you think so, you need an institution or degree to say that you're an expert in something? Well, okay. So there, there's, there's positives and negatives. Positive. Um, you're probably very good at creative and abstract thinking, right? And problem solving. Mm -hmm. um, and you're probably faster at learning things um, because you're probably on the more intelligent side of things or you can just think in your head better right? Uh, rather than looking at things like more TE focused or sensing people focused are, right? Um, however, there's problems. Where's our standardization? Where is our consistency? Um, have you ever heard of a positive feedback loop or what's also called circular logic? Mm -mm. For, for those who know who Dark Dawkins is, I'll give you an example. God is logic. If you believe in logic, then you believe in God. Dunked, atheist scum. <laughs> so the problem is, is that the, the, the conclusion is in the premise, right? Like the, the, there's a sneaky issue here, right? Mm -hmm. Like basic dog is dog. That's a tautology, right? Like the conclusions in, is in the premise. So it has to be true because I've created a nice little box in which it has to be true, right? A dog has to be a dog. Mm -hmm. Flawless argument. God is logic. I just presuppose that. That's just a brute fact, right? It's just true. So if you believe in logic, then you have to believe in God because he's the one who made it. So it would be illogical not to believe in him because he's given you these tools to like believe in him and he is the basis for logic. So if you have to base your reason in something, you base it in God. Therefore, you should believe in God. That's all the circular loop, right? Guess what the problem is? You can just say, I don't think God is logic. Bam! And the entire loop breaks, right? So what I notice, and I've interacted with enough TI users and NI users to, to know what it is you're talking about. They fall into, this seems intuitive and reasonable to me, but it just ends up being circular logic or having another fallacious issue because they don't put their systems to really truly be critiqued or to take information from other systems or other people. That's the problem that I see with that. Wasn't pretty much everything like an abstract idea at one point and some can be correlated and some can't, but I think everything's an abstract. I think everything's an abstract idea. Mm -hmm. it, if you want to think about it that way, a chair is an abstract idea. Well, define a chair to me, for, for example. Define a chair. Uh, something you sit in for, made for one person, typically. Okay, right, right, okay. That's how you define a chair. I define a chair as anything with four legs, <clears throat> right? And is something you can sit in. It doesn't have to support your back, right? Uh, so a stool is a chair, a school chair is a chair. Is a couch a chair? Probably. Uh, but four legs and you can sit in, well, a car 
right? Or other things that start to fit that definition. So, and this is like, this is like Platonism, right? This is like the idea of like, what is essential qualities of things? What is the perfect form of these objects we see, right? There's a perfect form of cup. We can't see it. Mm -hmm. uh, when we were souls in the ether, according to Plato, we saw this platonic world. And then when we went into this one, we like forgot it all, but it's in our unconscious, unconscious somewhere. And that's why like we can like define things roughly, but we don't really know what they truly are. Um, and that's why we argue what the true forms of things are. Um, there you go. Everything's abstract, right? Um, if you don't believe in any of that nonsense, you're just going to be like language and whatever ideas is just whatever can describe as an, and is instrumental. So I don't care if there's a platonic world that's like the basis for all cups. That sounds ridiculous, right? Um, though this is what most religious people believe about morals, right? Mm -hmm. Is that there's a perfect good, a perfect bad and, and whatnot, right? There's, there's a perfect justness, right? They believe the same thing. You can just say, none of that matters. It seems to me through my faulty senses, I'm making an assumption that this cup is just whatever I describe it to be. I could call this a chair and just define a chair as a cylindrical object that holds nice coffee. We can define anything to be anything. This is like Wittgenstein's idea. He's going to call it language games. When we grow up, we get taught to point at things and say, oh, that's a cup. And then through the use of that, we then kind of learn what that it is, but we never actually do. It's more like we're approximating what it is. We can't actually describe it bereft of minds what it is. We have this linguistic barrier. I say hello, you say hello, we speak the same language. We could meet, we have different associations and connotations in sub meanings when we use that word right mm -hmm. and so therefore you and i are just approximating we're in like similar spheres of influence we're never gonna like i'm never gonna know your exact language or anyone else's so we're all approximating so therefore everything is abstract all that matters is just whatever is instrumental and description that's close enough for the other person right and so trying to relate that back to MBTI and typology. Yeah, they're, they're trying to like say instrumental things. I find it all very unintuitive. I find it all very, a, a bit of a game it, because they can't even standardize their language. Some cognitive functions, there's a system that like tries to type you based on your smile. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, you'll find it in slope system for those of you who are listening, please never go there on discord um and they try to type you on your smile they have completely different ideas of cognitive functions and, and what exactly they mean and entail than like mbti we don't have that issue in psychology we argue a little bit about what to call factor one or factor two but none of us disagree that there's at least five factors so instrumentally and intuitively, I find that to be more useful and just less of a waste of time and less ideological. Because I find like a lot of the typology community to be heavily ideological and, and to be very prone to bias. And, and that's not saying that's typology in of itself. I'm saying that's the people who embody that system. Okay, so like very intuitive people, idealistic people, they're the ones that kind of drive change in society and new innovations and stuff like that. And typically like the STJs, the SFJs, they kind of get it, then they keep it that way for long as they really can and they resist change. So what would you say, like, there's no place for like people like who can just dream of an idea and make it in reality? No, I'm just saying those people shouldn't have a blank check as much as people who are very conservative about ideas aren't Marcus Aurelius talking about stoicism mm -hmm. said that a good doesn't necessarily occur because of a change nor do a lack of a change is just a change a stationary is just a stationary how we value it is whatever right that's that's it but a change in of itself is neither good nor bad and so 
I'm just saying that it depends what values we want to ascribe. If, if you want to change the world of personality psychology, my recommendation is I think there's better ways to do it. That's all I'm saying. Be firebrands. I am a very firebrand ESTJ. I'm highly progressive for a fucking ESTJ from what I understand. Um, I want that change, goddammit, right? It's just that I want it done with the least amount of errors possible. <laughs> and my job is to try to do both. And it's really hard. It's to try to get that change in there and try to make it as efficient as a, and as effective as possible. And so people who specialize in that are going to do that way better than I am. And I'm going to clean up their mess way better than they do, right? And, and that's how we'll work together. But I think any user can be anything. You know, um, it says ESTJs are really good at being managers and like leaders and stuff. I think like INFPs and ISTPs and like whatever else can be good leaders. Anyone can be a good leader, right? That's, that's, that's how I see things. You just have different challenges. Like what I was talking about with ESTJs, we're not good at talking about our feelings. So most of the time we come off as these very conservative, very traditional people. I'm not. I'm very open about my feelings, right? Um, that doesn't always mean I'm very good at emotional communication, but that's due to different issues. As you said, we all have different traumas. So I think any type can do anything. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very dangerous to get too worked up in like the stereotyping of types. Yeah. I think we should just try to focus more, if you're going to be a typologist, try to focus more on how would a TE user approach philosophy? I've never met another ESTJ that likes philosophy and is like liberal in that philosophy as I am. Like no other TE user is going to say, oh, all language is subjective. So it's whatever is most useful. No, they're going to argue for like Platonism, like objective language, something we call language prescriptivism. Hello means hello, God damn it. I'm just going to look at them and be, what? What does that mean? Right. I'm going to be the firebrand challenger. And I'm also a one wing nine Enneagram for anyone interested. So like, what I think Enneagram, I'm sorry to catch it. One wing nine. Okay. And then uh, I think it's like three wing four, five wing six. Uh, I think that's my tri type. And then uh, SXXO. So like, and I've never been typed ESTJ uh, or a different thing in, in any other system. So I've always been ESTJ, interestingly. But uh, yeah, I mean, like, again, like, I'm not particularly traditional for an ESTJ. And that's why I don't like ENTJs <laughs> most of the time. It's because those are the people I find to be very traditional, even though I know that they can not. They can use their TE, their, their other functions differently if they choose to. And so I've met an ESTJ that's a fucking communist. And it was the craziest thing, right? Because, like, most people think ESTJs are like post neoliberals or like neoconservatives, like these ultra and, or, or very religious. I'm not right. I am not a very openly religious person. So, but I'm very stringent about my values that come from stoicism, but I'm not like preaching to people. I don't think of people as lesser because of that. And I think a lot of people think ESTJs and ENTJs are that kind of people. Let me tell you, son, you're not wrong. We do have those internal feelings, but I think that's a lot of people, right? I think that's just humans in general. So that, that's my two cents on any type can be anything. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I think that's one big reason that people don't like typology and MBTI, especially I was talking to Joyce Bing, who's a YouTuber and MBTI practitioner. Uh, she said that she thinks the biggest uh, rebuttal against uh, MBTI is because it's in using a corporate level and they say, mm. well, you're an ESTJ. So you have to be the HR manager. Mm. You're an INTJ. So you have to be, I don't know where we would fit in corporate level. Uh, I guess mm. like higher up or whatever. I don't know. Right. But they try to like, okay, you're this type. So you can't do this. You know, you had to go work in a mail room you know, or something. And, and it, it completely ignores what those people's social skills or social or dispositions are because I'm an ESTJ who scores approximately a 35 or so on extroversion, which is pretty low uh, for a big five. How am I an ESTJ? And I'm, a, I'm on the low end of extroversion. Because remember, for those of you who don't know, it's a bell curve. Approximately 68 to 70% of the people are going to be within one standard deviation. Mm -hmm. So if 50 is the middle, 40 is the one standard deviation, 60 is the other. 
it's not going to be a very big difference from 50 to 1640 to 50, right? It's going to be noticeable, but it's not going to be a huge difference. We wouldn't necessarily call those persons extrovert or introvert. They just have leanings, right? That's um, a preference. It's not always true. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like you could, you could score a 60 on extroversion and be like, well, they're a party person most of the time, but we know in this particular context, they're not right. Someone who's like an 80 or 90, those, the, the more extreme statistical people are like the people who are like, yeah, man, anytime, any day. Right. The frat boys I loved. Right. Um, so I score a 35 yet. I've been told I give speeches very well. I've been told that I um, one man army and, you know, am the uh, the pariah in front of 20 people disagreeing with me. I've given lectures on stoicism before um, and generalized anxiety disorder because I studied that for a little bit at, like over and over again. I, I have to deal with frat parties all the time because I live with frat brothers. I have for a very long time, uh, though I'm not a frat brother myself. So Yet I score 35 on extroversion on the big five and I'm an ESTJ. Why is that? Well, it's because that's not how I would prefer things to be. That doesn't mean I'm not good at handling those situations. Very different. You can be an introvert and be a very well-trained extrovert, right? But you would rather prefer things be here and vice versa and vice versa right? You can be an extrovert who's capable of shutting up and capable of Zen, right? And going without people. Because the big five isn't asking for your social skills a lot of the time. It's asking for your social dispositions. Do you enjoy being the spotlight? Nope, but I can dance like a motherfucker, so I have no problem with it, right? But I don't enjoy it. I don't desire it. Congratulations, you're lower on the extroversion score. One That's what that, we're looking at. One thing about the big five that I have a, that I'm skeptical about a bit, like introversion, extroversion, like they say, like extroversion, it's made up of a bunch of other mini traits. And they say, these are the five traits that are commonly found in people consistently, but I have them right here. Yeah. So it's like, well, I don't know. I don't have it in front of me. So uh, extroversion is like what assertiveness, gregariousness, you could probably read them off. But, friendliness, uh, friendliness, activity level, excitement, seeking and cheerfulness. Okay, but I'm I score very low on big five for in, uh, extroversion, introversion. I'm like usually on a 14, 15. Okay, and I also have avoidant personality disorder, so that's probably why. And I'm mm -hmm. overcoming all that, but mm -hmm. I can be I worked in corrections for five years, so I'm pretty assertive when I want to be. I can be right. I'm you know, I'm very high in openness, usually intuitives are, um, right. and I could and uh, you know, excitement, risk taking. I, I like to do judo and stuff and martial arts, so. <laughs> it's kind of weird how it places me so low, but I do like these things. That's just one of their criteria of being an extrovert or high in extroversion. Right, exactly. And so it's like, that's, the, you know, the question becomes, do you want to be assertive, right? You know, it's mm. like, well, no, but that doesn't mean I'm not good at it, right? Um, I don't, I'm good. I, I like martial arts, right? I would be good, hopefully, at relatively defending myself against the average person. Do I want to? No. So my excitement stick is lower, right? Yeah. If I was like, fuck yeah, I wish a motherfucker would, right? Which, you know, every, every now and again, <laughs> but <laughs> then it would be higher, but it's not, right? So it, you got to think about it like that. The skills of what you're good at, how you've overcome your introversion, is, is not what we're able to detect within the big five. We're only able to detect how you would prefer things to be. And there will be some correlation there, right? Um, for example, someone with your score, which is probably bottom like 9%, uh, so 91% of the US population would be more extroverted than you is how to read that. Um, you're going to struggle maybe with emotional connections, having lots of friends, making friends. Uh, then this sounds like avoidant personality disorder or avoidant attachment style, mm -hmm. uh, which by the way, I have avoidant attachment style, though not the disorder. Um, well, introversion goes right in with that, right? Because we're, we're going to want to avoid conflict and what do introverts do? They avoid conflict if they can, right? They, they don't want to get involved with all these people and all this craziness, they don't need to be in a socially bubbly to be happy, right? They'd rather be doing something by themselves. 
So it's, it's just all about preference, right? Mm-hmm. And there'll be some correlation with it, but it's not always going to be a one-to-one. You can find introverts who are better at some th- who, who have some extroverted skills, but you will find, you will still find the introverted trends, right? You will still find it. Okay. Before I jump into the cognitive functions and how they kind of uh, look for you, what is the difference between Hexaco and Big Five, really? I know it's pretty similar. So basically, there's a big debate on whether or not we should have five factors or six factors. Um, The way it works is that each factor, factor one is the strongest, factor two is lesser, factor three, factor four, factor five. Factor five is controversial because in its openness, the most vague one, right? Mm -hmm. Because it has the most statistical noise, right? So the debate is whether or not we should divide agreeableness into two, into agreeableness and honesty slash humility, from what I understand. And the problem with that is that there's a little bit more statistical noise. And so thusly, it's a little harder to get good, reliable scores, right? And valid scores. But for the most part, it's, it's pretty much as successful as Big Five at doing what it wants to do. So it's just adding in that extra factor. Um, and it's going to divide agreeableness into two separate factors. Okay. I'm kind of in the middle with agreeableness. And right. And, and so that score might change if we were to divide it and we make honesty slash humility, sincerity, and we just make agreeableness, friendliness, right? Or accommodating <clears throat> uh, behavior or trust, morality, altruism, blah, blah, blah. If we took those out and made that honesty, humility, then your agreeableness score is going to be different, right? Because now we have different questions. So how consistent do you think like big five hexaco scores are? Like, say you wake up refreshed in a good mood and you take it and you score certain. What if you like a couple of days later, you know, you're not subconsciously trying to answer consistently. You're just answering how you your feel or your emotion, like mm. you're tired or you're hungry or you had a bad day and you test totally different. Is that something that's common? Um, typically, no. Right. Not unless you're trying to do it on, on like purpose, like something we do detect is when somebody, let's say <clears throat> you're taking a big five score as a part of a job interview. Uh, if you try to answer super conscientiously, we can actually like account for that. We can like make your score lower, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we can say, okay, if this person has a- answers these questions in this way, in this particular pattern, automatic negative 20 points, right? Because we know that they're trying to hunt down all the conscious conscientiousness points. Um, and we can account for other things, but I do have a study from McCray and Costa who are like the biggest guys on this. Um, so on environment and development of traits over time, there is much debate about the effect of mature maturation on personality, but one study, Lesser 1983, and McGew and Bacon and Lichen in 1993 did show that conscientiousness did change in college adults into later adulthood. I believe by like about five to 10 points. Um, And there's also cultural patterns. So as Americans get older, our extroversion and openness scores start declining with age and agreeableness and conscientiousness start increasing. This is also found in Italy, Germany, Portugal, et cetera. That's Costa et al. and McRae et al. 1999. Um, So generally speaking, there's going to be pretty consistent results within a span of about 10 years um and there's going to be limited change we're talking like 10 points or so um not factoring in things like depression and addiction and uh physical trauma and like all that stuff right which is hard to account for but there there's a hundred thousand plus studies on this stuff so people have definitely tried to um how it all started is because depressed in the 1930s, the MMPI, which was made by um, John Bowlby, found statistically that depressed people answer in a very certain way to some questions compared to people who are non-depressed. Mm-hmm. Shocker, right? So therefore, we can track personality, right? To some degree, we can track depression, you know, depressed people, right? To a statistical certainty, right? So now we're just doing that for all these other traits and, and, you know, and depressive tendencies is going to be a part of neuroticism, right? It's nothing we would ever diagnose people with, right? 
but it is useful as a therapy tool. Um, and there are certain uh, variations of big five. Um, it's called like the Neo something something. And it's for like psychotic people and like mm. killers and psychopaths and stuff. Uh, it's not mm. the dark triad. It's completely different. And um, it's, it's meant to diagnose mentally ill people because when you take the big five, it's assuming you're basically neurotypical. So if you scored a zero on the big five, you're probably not neurotypical, right? Because you're in the 0.01% of the population, right? So you're probably like, if you scored a 0% on conscientiousness, you're probably like a hoarder or something, right? Like someone who severely struggles with like planning and like work ethic and self-efficacy and like doing anything and, uh, you know, and cleaning and all that stuff, taking care of yourself. And if you score 100, you're an absolute perfectionist freak that I'm sure the Nazis would uh, look very favorably on. So what if like, it, it just sounds kind of discriminatory in a way, like you get the example of an interviewer testing really, really high on conscientiousness. What if somebody just really highly conscientious and a go-getter? Yeah, exactly. And so, um, and that's on a job interview, right? Where we would apply that bias. They take the score again, which, uh, you know, you could, you can take the IPIP NEO uh, on online. And it's the mm -hmm. first result. It's about 120 questions, should take you about 15 minutes. And you, you get the score. It's not accounting for bias or anything at all. It's only accounting mm -hmm. for your gender and your uh, region that you're from. So because different countries have different bell curves um, and different languages, right? Uh, and, uh, and you get that result, right? Without that bias, you are a go-getter. Right. Uh, but it depends, it, you know, and it also depends. We can also try to eliminate bias by uh, other factors, such as giving the test in such a way in which we're trying to eliminate that person's bias. Um, the, the idea there is is to try to have so many questions that this person is trying to score 120. And that's not possible. They can only score 100. So you have to you have to uh, establish a negative 20 or 30 score or something along those lines to try to account for the bias questioning that they're trying to put there. Um, but it's all advanced statistical stuff that I don't study because I'm not a statistics student. Uh, I don't know how they fully account for all these mathematical biases in the way that they do, but uh, I know it is possible and that we get a pretty reliable score uh, in, in either scenario. But yeah, I mean, if, if they're a go-getter, then it doesn't really make much of a difference if they score an 80 compared to a 90, right? I mean, they're still a go-getter, you know? Their real, like scores an, their real score is a 90, but, like, due to, like, questionable bias, we made it an 80. Still a go-getter, right? Yeah. How did you score, like, in the 60s or 70s for conscientiousness? Mm, I score uh, 95. 95, okay. Not good. <laughs> a little, little too much, huh? A little too much, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of good to be kind of in the middle, maybe between like the 30s and 60s, maybe. Yeah, and if if you if you have really high conscientiousness and really high neuroticism, oh boy, yeah, your oh, life's yeah. gonna be miserable. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Mm -hmm. That's gonna that's gonna be something that is gonna be very high in both of those, as well as people with trauma. Yeah, I score pretty high in neuroticism, so. Right. You know, it's like if you if if you have had a lot of trauma in your life, you're going to you might respond. And one of the ways to respond to trauma is to become very organized, very dutiful. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Very avoidant. Right. And um, so you, you become much more conscientious than maybe you normally would have if you didn't have that trauma. That's another thing about like these scores is that, you know, you're you're born let's say you're born with a certain score the environment especially your parents are going to help develop that a little bit yeah and so costa and mccray are like going to say that like it's pretty hard to change and what they mean by that is for the average person right but if you're not the average person because you have trauma or addiction or you've had depression which is not as common as people think right uh, for example, anxiety is only 5% in the lifetime uh, prevalence rate, right? Uh, that's one in 20. That's not as common as people think uh, for specifically generalized anxiety disorder. And so, but
but you hear people talk about anxiety all the time it's not the same thing and so it's just like that's something that we have to think about these environmental factors and how they might affect our scores and so instead of maybe i would have just had a 60 unconsciousness if i never had trauma now i have 90 because that's that's how I coped with it. My coping mechanisms develop my personality in such a way to where my personality disposition is to be highly conscientiousness because I like problem solving because that's how I deal with my trauma. That's my coping mechanism, right? There you go. Yeah. These yeah. are these are hard <clears throat> things to account for when we don't know everybody's life story, whoever takes the test that's public domain, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're just trying to say, what is your personality disposition right here, right now, snapshot? It's going to be pretty damn consistent throughout your life. But obviously, if you're depressed and you take the big five, like your scores are going to be a bit different than if like you're having a normal day, right? If you can have one of those, because if you're psychothematic or if you're bipolar, it can be very difficult. Yeah, it can vary by mood or environment. Right. And, and, and so if you if you want a consistency, take the big five test uh, over a series of six months and we probably have a pretty good average for you, which is what we do anyways. So. And I mean, it's going to be very small differences. OK, we're getting pretty low on time, I like to keep about an hour to hour and a half. Uh, okay. I like to get into the functions a little bit. I think you demonstrated TE quite a bit, naming your sources and your credential. Uh, this study, this person, this person. So how else do you use TE in your life? Um, I try not to. <laughs> uh, I try to use it when in jiu-jitsu, right? Or martial arts. I try to think about what this person's move set is trying to do when they grab my leg a certain way or they're trying to grab uh, my head and establish control or anything. I try to think process by process but I also try to think intuitively which is difficult and I try to go with the flow and I try to do both of that processorial thinking and that like more free flow thinking and and that muscle memory thinking as I like to call it in in that tends to go pretty well um, for relationships and for like friendships and stuff when anyone says something to me I always go what do they mean by what they say? And then like, I start to break it down, right? And I go, this thing, that thing, blah, blah, blah. Rather than just listening to my gut, but I can do both. I get, I get a feeling that it's this thing, my instinct says this thing, and then I try to prove it or disprove it. I try to go, is that a justified in, like instinctual feeling to have? Okay, very cool. Uh, what about SI? I know like, People think like martial arts would be an SE thing, but it also be an SI thing. It's a lot about like choreography, practice, repetition is a good thing for SI users to learn a martial arts. And how do you use SI in life? Um, yeah, um, I'm not the best guy to ask, but basically it's like uh, you have this internal sense for the natural order of things, right? Is what I'm going to understand more or less as I to, to be. Uh, and so it's like, I try to go with that natural sense, that natural internal logic of things. And I try to apply that through repetition, choreography, shadow boxing. I think shadow boxing would be great for a lot of SI users because you're using a lot of that internal sensing to be like, what feels right here? What, you know, what combos am I throwing in that feels right, that seems natural? Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that's really um, an important introverted exercise to do. Okay, yeah, it's also about like recalling past memories and uh, <clears throat> kind of applying to the present situation. It's a lot like NI, but it's more past focused where NI is more future focused. Uh, it's about like, you know, being very traditional a lot of times, like keeping the things the way they are. Uh, but you said that, you know, you're very open-minded and you do seem very open-minded for an ESTJ. What about- Yeah, I used to struggle with SI quite a bit. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a pessimistic function, a second function. So it's not something that you would prefer to use really. Mm. And how about your extroverted intuition? You kind of said that you try to do martial arts more intuitively, trying to kind of see like the other possibilities and outcomes of the future external possibilities, like all the possibilities basically. 
yeah exactly like you know i try to listen to that gut instinct it's just like when someone's throwing a hook right like you don't you don't have time to sit there and analyze that it'd be like okay is the fist like vertical is it horizontal like what what direction is it coming through? you don't have time to te right mm-hmm. you use your fucking eddie right then and right there right yeah. and so you learn how to react instinctually by the small the small intuitive things um mm-hmm. And it's just like, okay, it's generally this thing. And I'm going to go with that generalization, which would drive TE nuts, right? And even probably TI. But um, you just have to go with it. You have to get a feel for things. Um, And if you don't, then you're going to get hurt. Um, So that's how I generally go with uh, any is just what what feels, uh, what can I react to instinctually, uh, which is hard because I want to challenge that instinct. That's my first instinct. Yeah, and he's not exactly my my big bread and butter thing, but it's like, do you go against like a certain guy a lot and you're like, okay, he's mm. very typical using this move and this guy would prefer to use this technique. Is that mm-hmm. something you can pick up on fairly easy? Uh, yes, yeah, I, 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 I make a good read, instinctual read on people very quickly. And I go, okay, this person's shorter than me. And I see by the way that they're lowering themselves, they're a wrestler, right? Mm-hmm. I don't need to focus on like all the exact details. I just know what they're doing as soon as they try to do it. And I'm going to try to react the best way I can in that moment. Um, I don't even think if someone shoots for my legs, I don't think guillotine, right? Like I just do it right? Like you train yourself to react certain ways to things. So you don't have to think about it. And if you're in a situation in which you're not sure what to do, listen to your instinct. What seem, what, what feels right. I think, I think that's all good to do. Yeah, for sure. And, and obviously, you know, for those listening, you can make your own metaphors for any other sport or any other situation in life uh, for relationship stuff. What seems to be the right move here? Well, if your head isn't giving you anything, then you have to listen to your instincts. You, you have to explore these uh, other, other hypotheses, these other hypotheticals, um, and, and go with your gut on that before maybe uh, going back to your head. Okay. And you talked about, the, uh, about this a little bit, uh, FI and fear. You said you're fairly open, talking about your emotions and your feelings and your own like personal compass. How does that look for you? Uh, interestingly, I have been told I am a mysterious or complex person by most of my real life friends, um, which I think is interesting. I'm not sure if other ESTJs suffer from that, but, um, I, my FI is going to be, I can talk about personal things in my life, but in such a way that it comes off as factual and is bereft of the emotional, like impact and like tone there. And so that's where I'm getting better at doing that is like, these things sucked. Here's why. Here's how I felt. Here's what happened. Not just here's what happened. Yeah, it sucked. And then that's it. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's really hard for a lot of people in general, especially (laughs) TE users. So you don't really, you intellect, intellectualize your emotions, you'd say? Yeah, rational, rationalization, right? And that's my first instinct to do. It's a lot of people with avoidance, um, a lot of people with trauma, uh, but you can get good at like, here's how I did feel about it, right? Like, and trying to connect with those emotions again. That's, that's like the hard thing to do. Because I think most people communicate emotionally, right? And so if you're not good at that, then yeah, it's going to be a problem. Yeah, yeah. Some people... I think that needs to be a, a balance of the two and some people right. go one way or the other too much. Right. <clears throat> okay. And then the shadow functions, your TI uh, opposing personality that opposes your TE kind of your own original ideas. You go off sources a lot more rather than kind of like an intuitional sort of thinking, like your own intrinsic thoughts. How about that for you? Um, they're, they're not as uh, present and as like, powerful as they used to be but i do get like internal original thoughts every now and again and i then what i do is then i put it to the extroverted you know sensing and thinking right um so anything i have that is internal then gets systematized it it just doesn't stick on its own and like grows like a tree in its own little environment right 
I always have to systematize it. So I guess I don't really listen to my DI much other than when I think it gives me a good idea every now and again. Okay, and uh, extroverted sensing <clears throat> uh, cynics, it's kind of like you're very, uh, don't like to go out of your comfort zone, really. You're very critical of other people's appearances. Like I had an ESTJ boss, like I had a safe, like one of those tacky yeah. neon safety vests and it was like the Velcro was crooked. She mm -hmm. would adjust it for me. Or I do uh, judo with an ESFJ who shares the same function. Every time my gi gets all twisted up, he straightens it yeah. up for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When the belt, when the belt's loose, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. something you do a lot. Uh, for my training partner, yeah, yeah. I don't. I've gotten better at that. I've gotten better at keeping my judgments in here and not acting on them if I have any, and just being less judgmental in general. Um, I try to make it more of a pattern okay, this person looks this way. They may be like this stereotype. They may have these issues. They may not. Let's be open-minded. But once they like start to give themselves enough rope to hang themselves, then I just can't help it. I'm like, okay, yeah, this is this kind of person. I'm, gonna, I'm still going to treat them normally to the best of my ability, like I would treat any other human being. And they're probably not going to notice the difference but they're probably not somebody I want to be friends with or like whatever the conclusion is. So yeah, the, the judgment is there, but I try to be like far more fair about it and like far more open-minded. So like, if you have a friend that consistently goes to dinner in a higher end restaurant and flip flops, gym shorts and a t-shirt, it's kind of like a, Oh, I'd be all for it. Oh, I'd be all for it. I'd be like, Oh yeah, man. What's up? <laughs> like I, you should have told me. <laughs> I, I like, you know, I, I was in a class and uh, my professor asked me, how would I deal with like a troublesome like group member? And I just, I just went on, I, I just said, just normally I was like, I'd ignore the bastard. And, <laughs> and the teacher, the professor was just not ready for that. And, you know, people were laughing and whatever. So it's like, I'm, I'm a weird ESTJ because I'm willing to like walk the line. That's where I, where, that's where I have fun. That's where I progress rules is by challenging them by walking that line. And I, and I'm an advocate of stoicism. Stoicism does not work with most social norms in the States, right? Mm -hmm. It does not. So I'm already a firebrand, right? For that. And I am, I am unapologetic mm -hmm. in it. That doesn't mean I'm going to do things to get attention and to be notorious. It just means that that's how I'm fundamentally going to function. So how old are you? You look pretty young uh 22 22 if i had a beard i'd look 25 but you know I, I i gotta do what i gotta do it seems like most estjs i encountered once they hit eh, about after they get out of college 24 25 to about 60 to about the time they retire they're kind of sticks in them but then they kind of relax a little bit mm. before and after but once they get into work it's like okay i had my fun time to put my nose mm. to the grindstone and uh right take care of business do you think i don't like think that? i'll ever no, no. I think I was like that. And so I think I'm going to have the opposite development almost, right? I was like that super stringent, super uptight. Uh, and then now I'm less like that, uh, you know, not about necessarily my morality, but about everything else in my life. I hold myself to a high standard, more or less. That doesn't mean I'm going to hold everybody else to that. And even then, that doesn't mean I won't smash beards of frat boys, right? Um, so I, I think as I'm getting older, I'm getting emotionally healthier and I'm getting better, more emotionally fulfilling relationships. And I think that's going to make me more relaxed, not less. Um, and I don't want a career in which I like have to be super uptight all the goddamn time. Right. Um, and being professional at work doesn't mean you can't be friendly and funny and like casual. You mm -hmm. know? So like reading like uh, the, the typology stereotypes and the descriptions and stuff did you like read like okay i tested estj i tested like this pretty consistently but i don't want to be like this has that been helpful to you at least i'm completely fine with whatever result i get i am i'm pretty apathetic about whatever result i get i find the description of estj to be accurate enough i i'm not complaining um if people pretty universally laud me as an ESTJ, and from what I understand from a couple of my friends who use an Ericsson's uh, system, I believe, or a modified version, um, I am the most typical TE user there has ever, I am the most like TE person they've ever met. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it. You know, I, I'm not personally attached to it. Someone tried to type me as ESTP though, because I like sports. 
Well, yeah, that's just going off stereotypes. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So I, I laughed and everybody <clears throat> who was in that room laughed who have typed me individually. Right. Mm-hmm. At various points in my life. So they, they were all busting out laughing. Um, I've been the slope system and people were trying to say I was like ENFP and stuff because I was philosophical. Right. Like, again, going off of like stereotypes and of different cognitive functions. It's like you and I agree. You can be anything. And if you're going to be analyzing people, you have to be able to pierce through more than what they're just telling you. You have to know the human being inside beyond their words and their language use. And that's what's hard for people. Yeah, the way I like to type people is just have a conversation with them and see how they answer and which functions they're using. Yeah, but you know, then, then that's difficult if someone's being fake or just like disingenuous or just doesn't know. Like if they have a defense mechanism, they're going to be very emotionally unavailable and like reserved and blah, blah, blah. And so they might come off as one type when in reality, they're another type. They just give you that defensive face. And there might be a little bit of leakage of their function, but maybe it's just not enough. Oh, they're still that TE hero or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, maybe. I mean, there's always going to be room for error. Right. Okay, uh, what about NI trickster? It's kind of like a blind spot where you're unaware and NI is like kind of like your own personal future looking at uh, the possibilities there and kind of lining them up and finding the best path forward. Kind uh-huh. of like looking like, I guess how I view things compared to how you view things. I think pretty much anything is possible and there's no way to rule everything out, man. Yeah, I, I have, I agree. Anything is possible. It's just what is plausible, right? Mm-hmm. And, and that's where I'm going to focus is uh, what do I think is likely? And I'm not going to get too personally attached to it. And so I think NI Trickster might mess up other ESTJs, but thanks to stoicism and like other things in my life, I just don't get too tripped up and worried about NI or my lack of understanding of NI. Okay. And this is where I've had the biggest confrontations. And I think most people have with... Uh... At ESTJs and ENTJs is FE demon oh. kind of like you walk all over people's feelings and you don't even yeah. consider it and it just kind of makes you sick yeah yeah when I was uh I'm a firebrand now when I was younger even though I'm not that old oh boy yeah anything went anything went now not so much um now it's more like a, I'm not a personally attached to your feelings. I, I'm, I understand you're upset and I don't want to make you upset. But if I have to tell you what I think is the truth uh, in such a way that might be upsetting to you, but I think is in your best interest, then I'm going to. We've all, we've all had that, I think. We've all had that one friend where we've just had to be, listen, enough. I've tried to be nice. I've tried to show you other ways. I just have to tell you straight to your face as bluntly as possible how what you're doing, right? We've all had that. I think just ESTJs just do that more often. Mm-hmm. Um, I've definitely gotten better at not doing that and, and like being far more cautious and diplomatic in my approach of like handling issues and like people's feelings. But when we're in a philosophical debate and I've not personally insulted you and I'm not berating you and I'm not talking over you and you're just upset with how I put something, but you don't have the problem with the content of what I've said, then I just don't care. And, and people don't realize this. You can argue mm-hmm. for cosmopolitanism, universal brotherhood, the elimination of, uh, you know, uh, of concepts of race and sex and like all this stuff. Right. And, you know, preach like universal human treatment, but put it in such a way that it sounds aggressive. And that's what ESTJs do is we're, I think we're super idealists that put things in very aggressive ways. And that's what's so off to people. And so they'll never have a problem with so much of the content of what you said, more or less. They'll just have a problem with how you put it. I don't care, right? Like analyze me for what I think is important, not because I said fuck and you don't like the word fuck, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think INTJs have a similar problem. We have FE trickster work and not aware of other people's feelings and emotions. And we kind of rationalize that when they try to come to us for a, mm. like comfort, I guess. And I worked in behavioral health with kids. So I kind of learned how to skate around that and use my TE and my FI to kind of put myself in their shoes and, you know, find solutions for them. But a lot of times we rationalize people emotions when they just want validation. So kind of wow. similar, we kind of steamroll it over them, but you know, 
and it kind of rubs us the wrong way, but we're just kind of clueless that we're doing it rather than like, I hate it that you have that. Right. I, yeah. Our, your first instinct can be to rationalize those emotions rather than <clears throat> just taking them as they are. And there, that's the idea of living in the present. And that's very hard for people with avoidance and trauma. It can be very difficult to do that. Yeah. And it's just like, like if you were to fix the problem, then you wouldn't feel these emotions. So I'm trying to help you, but yeah, people... I'm, I'm solution focused because yeah. that's how I approach life. Well, if this person just wants to be comforted and just wants a goddamn hug, then like, you know, and, and that's, that's difficulties. Just knowing when somebody just needs to be supported. Yeah. Yeah. Some people just need to process that for a very, very long time before they take action. And it's a little frustrating for I guess you have to use that sophos, that practical wisdom, right? Virtue number yeah. uno of stoicism is that when does this person just need comfort? When do they need the solution? Right. When the these are two different talks. They may be here, they may be here. This one may never happen, right? Yeah. yeah All that matters is that you see the difference. And just when their conclusion they come to it, if they don't, I guess that's their issue. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. So one thing I'm a little confused about, you seem like you identify yourself as an ESTJ, even though you're really critical of it. What, what exactly is it because you tested consistently? Why is that? I, I have no reason to argue that I'm not ESTJ. Uh, but to be fair, it's not like I'm super in depth with these things. Mm -hmm. It's just that generally everyone I've talked to who has a high reputation of typing people so whether that be Corvo or Dolphin or um, Xeon or um, uh, many other people, I have just universally heard e even, you know, when I'm being myself and we're doing these conversations, ESTJ, just at some point. Um, anyone who like typed me differently seemed to be going off of stereotypes and like not realizing I was like playing to them a little bit not not being fake but like kind of trying to relate to them specifically rather yeah. than talking about myself and so that's that's what happened with sports right is you know how do you feel about sports I'm like well I could be passionate about it I played for most of my life blah 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 you know and that's that's where he got caught up it's like oh so you're ESTP right and blah 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 in his specific system I blame that a lot on like an internet memes. Like they'll say like, oh, nine TJ has SC inferior, so they can't be athletic. I've always been fairly athletic my whole life, but you know, just not like an ESTP where I'm just going to do it all the time. An ESTJ can't be aware of their feelings and can't be aware of others. Bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. Like they can't be psychologists. Bullshit, right? Like not true. We can be, we can be therapists. We can be empathetic people, right? Like it's just not true. I find that they usually become like therapists or social workers, but they take administrative tasks once they get there. Right. And, and that would be maybe the average comfort, right? Is be more of an experimental psychologist, the non-clinical side of psychology, which ironically applies to me. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's like, no, it's, it's not necessarily true that we can't like be human workers or we're like, you know, work in charities and stuff with people, right? And that requires a lot of empathy. It's just not always our comfort, right? Yeah. But we can do it, right? And we can excel in it even. Okay. So these are baseline questions that I ask everybody, and I don't know if you have an answer to them. Uh, what is sure. your favorite type? Mm, um, I, think, I think it was ESTP. Uh, I think it was one of those or ef um or eftj yeah or 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 uh e i e e n t j no no e n t j is one of my least it's uh esfp and stuff like that so the people who are using the extroverted and the sensing but they they're they're perceiving and feeling instead and their 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 cognitions it's really interesting to me because they can be really bubbly people yeah. And I'm, I'm all for that. Right. But they, they, they tend to be like a little bit more hippie ish. And I, you know, I live in Asheville and for any, any of you who know what Asheville is like, it's very hippie ish. And yeah. so it's like, I'm a very non-traditional UCJ. So I like the more chillaxed, uh, but still systematic, still, still have a bit of a dagger in them. Right. You know, they, they still have that organizational predator <clears throat> there underneath the social bubbly idiot right or whatever or a casual laid-back person those, those are types i tend to get along, along with a lot that my least favorite types because i know that's the next question 
I tend not to get along well with like INTJs, but especially, especially ENTJs. They have been my rivals. Um, we have, I have had the most heated debates I have of anybody else with ENTJs. They genuinely annoy me because they are like the TE Nazis and they drive me nuts. <laughs> um, eventually, after lots of trying and lots of alcohol, right, you can, you know, you can, impatience, you can, we can formulate friendships. But I find a lot of ENTJs that like trying to be my father or something. And I, or like these like snobby elitist. And I don't think that's all of them. I think that's some of them. And they drive me nuts. Uh, INTJs, very intellectually focused, uh, you know, not afraid to come at me, right? With their, with their you know, introverted uh, intuition, I believe, and, and whatnot. And I'm, we're not very good in debates. Corvo Antano, if you know who he is, uh, is uh, I believe an INTJ. And uh, we, we bash heads, right? Mm -hmm. Like we really do. Um, because I'm all about citation and like sis outside systems. He's all about like internal systems and like going about these things differently. And I'm just like, you're a fucking crazy person. So. Ironically enough, I found you on an ENTJ server too. Right, exactly. <laughs> I have somehow survived yeah. as one of the lone sensors on that server. <laughs> I heard a lot of the history about the server and it was like Marvel Civil War that sounded like it went off. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. There's I, there's very very little censors and a lot of like, you know, uh and, and that kind of stuff, but there's been a lot of drama there. Um I haven't met a lot of ISTJs or any of them, but I hear they're supposed to be good with me, like the whole sub ideology of golden types or whatever. Um there's supposed to be this idea that certain types are like perfect soulmates for each other. Mm -hmm. And I believe it was the ISTP. That's like the perfect one for the ESTJ. Golden pair. Uh, yeah. And I've only met one of them and they were not somebody I would ever date <laughs> as far as I'm aware. Yeah. I uh, think you need a little bit of compatibility and a little contrast. I think any relationship that's healthy to have a little uh, budding of heads. Yeah, exactly. I con, uh, there was a study can't cite it uh that said mm -hmm. that couples who have more conflicts but are able to work through them statistically last longer than couples who are avoidant of conflicts yeah because they just enable each other right right exactly it, one is cooperative problem solving and you tend to air out a lot of issues and more potentiality to solve them versus enabling the avoidance before the explosion Okay, the next question, for some reason, they are off and they're the same question in a row. It's supposed to be, what would you like others to know about you as an ESTJ or just in general? Well, we have feelings. And a lot of the time, trust me, we're capable of understanding yours. Uh, the pit we fall into is that we think that your feelings aren't as important as what we think the truth is. If we're running into it, just let us know. And also, if you have ESTJ friends, and you're having an issue, just tell them, hey, I just need support. I don't really need like problem solving. That can come later, I promise you. Or I really need you to help me solve this problem. Be super clear with them, which can be hard, but try, right? If you, The more clear you are with your ESTJ friends, the better they are to serve you. And once they do that, they will do that well. Uh, because it is, if you're our friends, we're going to care more about you than we're going to care about ourselves secretly. I know. Hard to imagine, but we do. We'd rather help you in that moment and do that the best we can than help ourselves. Yeah. To be honest, ESTJs and probably ENTJs have been the biggest conflict types for me. Yeah. Yeah. We're conflict solvers, right? So it's like, <laughs> if the conflict is I need to support you emotionally, I got you. I got you. I, I will do whatever I need to do, right? Uh, just let me know. Right. Because sometimes we're not always the best at like reading the situation. And so we may default to what we're comfortable with, which is that problem solution because we're, we're conflict generators. So that also tends to mean that we're good at solving conflicts because we get in them all the time. Fair enough. OK, the next question is supposed to be, uh, what would you like to know more about INTJs? <sighs> what drugs y'all take? Um <laughs> I guess more, I would like 
to spend more time thinking about their internal workings and getting to know how they come to the conclusions that they come to and why and learning more about their struggles with these systemizations and like trying to appeal to outside more rigorously done systems and what their issues are with that uh like with the body of science right um or something like that um and kind of like trying to narrow down why that is and i i don't do a lot of typological thinking so that would be a long time for me but it'd be interesting well my answer to that is because of our introverted intuition we kind of subconsciously take in data that we make these correlations in our head then we're kind of known as the most <coughs> efficient of the types because we can kind of think outside the box and find other solutions that other people typically don't think of mm. so like right now in our country and around the world estjs and istjs are probably the most in congress like biden's and ESTJs, yeah. i think and they just kind of cling on to these systems that aren't working like we have a broken Men mental health system we have a broken uh medical health system like the insurance uh yeah democracy is basically falling apart but they don't want to change so just like we kind of see these things and we're the only ones that can see them like you know like another intj or an infj can't see what i intuit and well you know i'm an estj and i see all the issues and more of what you're saying right especially mm -hmm. as somebody who's also in, in you know in the site community um I think ESTJs need to tweak themselves to be those radical reformers instead of the mm. diehard traditionalist, uh, yeah. which is strange to me because I've just never been that way myself. Like, not really. I thought I was, but not really. Um, so it's interesting to me. And plus, you know, ENTJs and INTJs are also going to have their bloody hands involved with all this as well uh, with systematic issues um so there just needs to be one side needs to learn to be a little bit more rebellious a little more radical the other side needs to need needs to learn to be a little bit more organized and to put things in such a way that works enough with the system without completely changing it because that's just not practical to do um you know as opposed to incremental change or just block change or lagging well, change right it's not necessarily that everything needs a rehaul just like I think like typology is important. I think there can, it may be hard to empirically pinpoint, mm. but I think trauma affects types differently. Uh, I think we all learn differently. Like the school system's made for SJs. It isn't made for other types. And that's why other types struggle. I think like I've been accused of being a psychopath. I've been accused yeah. of being autistic. I've been accused of having ADHD or whatever, Yeah. but I just don't fit that stereotype. And just, yeah. I might not be necessarily mental ill in those ways. I am definitely mentally, mentally ill. I'll admit that I definitely have my fair share of trauma, but you know, just because it's not a stereotype. Yeah. I'm just, just because I'm different. Doesn't mean I'm mentally ill in that way. You know? Yes, exactly. I, yeah. That a uh, therapy one oh one, right. Is that yeah. most normal people are pretty fucking weird in their own way. Right. Shocker. Yeah. Uh, and this is why you and I are going to be huge advocate. Name me another ESTJ who, who's as big a diehard advocate of therapy as I am. But in anyways, this is why you and I are going to be diehard mm -hmm. advocates of everybody does therapy because everybody can learn to think outside their box and also to think in boxes because different people are going to have different struggles. I'm a highly systemized person that needs to learn how to think outside the box and mm -hmm. to live in the moment, be more intuitive. Other people who are going to have that in spades need to learn to work within the box, right? To some degree, to some degree. Well, INTJs, ENTJs, the rationals, like Kiersey called them, they're very systematic. They're just systematic in a very intrinsic way, I think. Yeah, exactly. And so it's like, it's also about using our systemization in the name of change. And um, I, I've just, I've never met another mm -hmm. ESTJ for sure. I've only met like two others for sure. I've never met these ESTJs that are like these super traditional people, right? Oh, I have, I have. <laughs> and I, I, I've heard, I've heard, right? And so I assume the rumors to be true that they're a lot like ENTJs and it's horrifying to me. And so that's why I'm out here. And it, if it's true, if it's true, I'm an ESTJ. That's why I'm out here being like, hey, I know how to appeal to you and to try to convince you to switch your direction to the opposite direction. Instead of being incrementally conservative, you're incrementally progressive. Not, not that there's anything wrong or good about either one of those things. It's just that 
incrementalism can be used both ways. You know, you, we could be conservative on some things and regressive on others. I'm not saying you should be one way or the other. I'm just saying that you shouldn't be so focused on one thing and one way of doing things because your cognitions tell you and like your defense mechanisms tell you, right? Like you should make your own conclusions that, that you think are really true. Okay, just the, the, the trail back a little bit to finish my, uh, my explanation of your, the question. Uh, just because something has not been tested or even hasn't even been thought of before, it shouldn't be ruled out necessarily. Yeah. And I was talking to an ESTJ register. Uh, we haven't had much interaction with our newer for a while, but she's like talking about Biden. Like, oh, I thought I was going to like Biden because he was Catholic. <laughs> yeah, but he's not very presidential. Like, I'm not sure what that, that means exactly, but I was just like uh, smiling, nodded. Okay, I see your point. I apologize for, for the crimes of my people. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, you know, and this is what I, and this is the problem I have with like most people in the conservative communities. They tend to be reactionary, not conservative, because yeah. you're supposed to still be an advocate for change as a conservative, political science wise does not mean that's how people are going to behave so same thing with ESTJ same thing with a lot of things is that um people are going to be weird in their reasoning about things and this is why universally across the board I don't care what it is if you believe about anything I want critical thinking and that's why I'm going to be a big advocate of pragmat you know pragmatism and uh, specifically in, in philosophy and critical thought and logical thought um which we can use logical thought for our emotions, right? We, we, you know, and we can, if you like continental philosophy, I'm not saying it doesn't have a place, you know, but it, if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. I think ESTJs can do continental philosophy, talk about meaning and purpose and all this stuff. I'm a stoic, like I'm one to talk, right? Um, so yeah, I, I think it's all about if you're a certain type and you fall to certain faults, identify those faults and try to work past them in whatever way is best for you. All right. Well, I think we are about out of time. Do you have any last questions or comments? No, I think that was, that's all. All right. Well, thank you for joining me. I was uh, surprised. I thought it would be a lot more confrontational. I thought we we're going to butt heads <laughs> a lot more, but it's been a pleasant talk, I would say. Thank you. I enjoy myself too. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, if you like this content, please like, share, subscribe. Uh, you can add me on social media, INTJ Equation all around. I also have a Discord server, which you can find all down in the description below. Thank you for going on a clickbait. Have a great day.